Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Will Pomeranz, Deputy Director here at the Kennan Institute, and welcome to our noontime discussion. Uh, a few administrative announcements before we get started. First, I ask that everyone please turn off their cell phones and other electronic devices. Uh, we are coming to the end of our seminar series. Uh, we have only two more events before we break for summer. Uh, tomorrow, there'll be a seminar here from 3.30 to 5.30 with Jody Laporte and Danielle Lucier on the failure of democracy in post-Soviet Eurasia, again from 3.30 to 5.30. And then next Monday, we will have our last meeting with Catherine Graber, who will be talking about local media and ethnic politics in 21st century Russia. And that'll be a noon noon noontime discussion. And then we'll take our summer break and resume again on Monday, September 24th, where Mark Katz will be here talking about Russian-Iranian relations. Uh, it's our great pleasure today to have Eric Scott with us. He is a Title VIII supported research scholar here at the Kennan Institute. Uh, he recently finished his PhD in history from the University of California, Berkeley, and is busy here revising his manuscript for publication. Uh, but he will be joining the Department of History at the University of Kansas this August as an assistant professor of modern Russian history. So congratulations, Eric. And we look forward to your remarks. The floor is yours. Well, uh, thank you, Will. And uh, I'd like to thank especially the Kennan Institute for hosting me this summer as a Title VIII uh, supported research scholar. And I'd also like to thank my research assistant, Tom Lyles, who's uh, been a great help um, for me gathering materials for this project as I revise this into a, into a uh, broader book manuscript. Um, today I'll be talking about uh, the economic dimensions of my project and um, I want to begin with one of the, the literally dozens of jokes or anecdoti that uh, were told in the 1960s and 1970s in the Soviet Union about Georgian market traders. So a Georgian was on an Aeroflot flight uh, bound for Moscow when a hijacker broke into the cockpit and holding a pistol he demanded that the pilot change course and go to London. The pilot changed course but a second hijacker entered the cockpit with two guns and said take the plane to Paris so the plane was diverted again. Finally the frantic Georgian burst into the cockpit with a bomb in his hand and said take this plane to Moscow or I'm going to blow it up. The pilot agreed and changed course a third time. When they landed in Moscow, the first two hijackers were, of course, taken off to jail. But the Georgian with the bomb was met with a uh, warm congratulations by a delegation of high-ranking Soviet officials. Tell us, comrade, the officials who were slightly incredulous asked the Georgian, why, why did you divert the plane from Paris back to Moscow? To which the Georgian replied, what am I going to do with 5,000 carnations in Paris? So, although it might not, you know, be that funny in you know today's context, I think the joke alludes to several important dimensions of Georgian trading in the Soviet Union. First of all, this trading occurred in a relatively closed society, one which restricted foreign travel, and whose command economy created some strange incentives for money making based on the sale of somewhat prosaic but scarce goods like carnations. Second, because of the Georgian success in this trading, Moscow may have been the capital of a repressive state, but it was also a city of great economic opportunity. Third, and perhaps less obviously, Soviet officials often turned a blind eye to some of the more illicit forms of Georgian economic activity. Despite the trader's intent to illegally sell his flowers, he ends up being congratulated by the authorities while the other two hijackers end up in jail. This trade in flowers was not actually such an insignificant thing, nor were the flowers the only rare commodity that Georgians traded in. Georgians not only provided the obligatory flowers that Soviets needed for holidays and dates and to thank dinner hosts, they also supplied a range of other scarce and sometimes exotic goods that were crucial for everyday social rituals. For example, Georgia produced 95% of the tea grown in the Soviet Union, a beverage that um, if you've been to Russia, you know that it really punctuates the day from breakfast to office tea breaks to late night conversation around the dinner table. 
Georgia grew and sold most of the tobacco for the cigarettes that often accompanied tea. And Georgia cultivated 90% of Soviet citrus fruits, which citizens hoped to uh, obtain to grace their New Year's tables. Soviets toasted with Georgian wine and praised the Georgian mineral water, Borjomi, for its health benefits, which included, uh, importantly, serving as the perfect antidote for too much Georgian wine. This era of the 1960s and 1970s is often thought of as a time of zastoy or stagnation, but historians are beginning to uh, get a sense that even as the official economy stagnated, an informal second economy grew to meet the demand for consumer goods like these. Accommodating an increasingly urban, actually predominantly urban, Soviet population at this point, the state grew more tolerant of small-scale market trading while relying on the KGB to prosecute larger-scale operations. The recently declassified files of the Georgian KGB, which I'll be drawing on in my talk today, offer a rare view into the operation of informal Georgian trade networks and their interaction with the state. Now, generally speaking, the burgeoning Soviet marketplace was dominated by non-Russians. Tightly networked and entrepreneurial ethnic minorities proved extremely effective in obtaining goods and enforcing contracts in the absence of legal regulation. The Georgians figured prominently among a veritable chorus of ethnic outsiders in the marketplace. There were Azeri entrepreneurs gaining footholds in fruit and vegetable markets, Armenians occupying key economic positions as middlemen minorities, and Chechens gaining reputation for violent contract enforcement. The ethnic nature of the Soviet second economy was often lampooned in jokes of the kind that I began with today. These jokes played on reputed stereotypes and exaggerations of real cultural differences. But I would argue that in the Soviet second economy, reputation for being able to obtain rare goods or for having a propensity to violence could itself be a form of capital. Now, before going further, I'd like to say a few words about how today's presentation fits into my larger project. Generally, this is how we think of the Soviet Union as a multi-ethnic state composed of separate rep republics. Yet this map of national populations living in the Soviet Union shows that national groups and cultures were by no means confined to their titular republics, but instead traveled throughout the Soviet Union. Georgians moved beyond Georgia, Uzbeks beyond the Uzbek Republic, and Armenians beyond Armenia. While historians have for a long time emphasized the relatively sealed nature of external Soviet borders, these relatively closed borders hid an incredible internal mobility of populations. And so even as it closed off opportunities, the infrastructure of the Soviet Union made possible new forms of internal migration and exchange. Soviet nationalities easily crossed these internal republic borders to move out of their republics, but they were still marked as ethnically distinct by the category in their passport, uh, the category of nationality, which was based on descent. I argue that this, in effect, makes them in, in internal diasporas to the Soviet Union with a homeland and a host society in one state. And these mobile ethnic groups were encountered beyond the boundaries of their titular republics when one went to the market, listened to the radio, watched television, studied the names of the Politburo, uh, they were very uh, present in the lives of, of Soviet citizens. And so my dissertation, which I'm developing now into this manuscript, explores the broader significance of internal diasporas in the Soviet Union and focuses on the Georgians in particular. I argue that the importance of Geor the Georgian diaspora means we should think of the Soviet Union not simply as a Russian empire or merely a multi-ethnic state composed of separate republics, but as an empire of diasporas where politics, culture, and economics were constituted by the mixing of this diverse array of mobile nationalities. To take the argument one step further, the Soviet Union was not only an empire of internal diasporas, it was also an empire of internally produced commodities whose circulation was in many cases linked to specific diaspora networks. Since unlike classical diasporas, Georgians had a homeland and a host society in one state, they could easily link producers in the Caucasus with consumers in Moscow. Yet while they excelled as these pan-Soviet entrepreneurs, uh, 
the ethnic distinctiveness of Georgian networks and the explicitly exotic nature of the goods they offered was often emphasized and in fact capitalized on by the Georgians themselves. In my talk today, I'll focus on the, the crucial role the Georgians played when they came to the forefront of Soviet economic life in the Brezhnev era. I'll begin by discussing what it was that made Georgian traders so successful, and then I'll examine a few cases in, in greater detail to give you a, a better sense of how these trade networks operated. And finally, I'll conclude by considering the somewhat complicated implications of Georgian success in the Soviet period and its legacy in contemporary Russia. So what was it that made the Georgians so successful as, as pan-Soviet entrepreneurs? Uh, it would be easy, I think, to attribute Georgian success to climate, given that Georgia was one of the few places that things like flowers, tea, tobacco, and oranges could be grown within Soviet borders. This was, of course, thanks to the Southern Republic's celebrated subtropical climate, which is especially evident along the Black Sea coast, which you can see here. Certainly, climate is what Nikita Khrushchev had in mind when he complained in his memoirs about Georgians, quote, profiteering and speculating everywhere they go. Khrushchev uh, went on to say, quote, there are many temptations in Georgia for speculators. The climate is warm. There are many vineyards and many other human delights. He went on to say, quote, if people from some other nationality lived there, the same weaknesses would have been true of that nationality. If Russians lived in Georgia, they would do the same thing, explaining the prominence of Georgian traders in geographic rather than cultural terms. Of course, geography mattered, but so too did political climate. By the Brezhnev era, unofficial economic enterprises operated in Georgia on a vast scale, and they were largely tolerated by local party leaders. Informal exchange was practiced wildly across the Soviet Union, but perhaps nowhere more openly than in Georgia. To give some examples, while well, incomes officially stagnated in Georgia in the 1960s, by 1970, the size of the typical Georgian savings account was almost twice that of the Soviet average. Police reports regularly complained about the public's toleration of the theft of state resources and the flagrant display of illicit gains in the form of big parties thrown at restaurants and lavish homes constructed along the Black Sea coast. Given this festive and somewhat freewheeling atmosphere, it's perhaps uh, not surprising that another joke dating to the Brezhnev era said that the loudspeaker at the Tbilisi rail station announced trains leaving Tbilisi for the USSR. <laughs> Georgian traders benefited from having this homeland that provided not only valuable resources, but also a sanctuary for informal enterprises. But the, the ability of these traders to market their goods beyond Georgia was also due to distinctive cultural practices that were both strange and familiar in the Soviet context. On the one hand, they made up a relatively exclusive community that was bound by a, a distinct language and uh, one that was basically indecipherable to outsiders. And on the other hand, and I'd be happy to get into this more in the question and answer session, uh, for reasons relating to Georgia's historical place in the Russian Empire, Georgians were generally comfortable operating in a predominantly Russian environment. Their skill lay not only in their ethnic distinctiveness, but also in their ability to cross ethnic boundaries to make deals and market their products to Soviet consumers of all nationalities. As I'll try to show in the cases that follow, Georgian entrepreneurs emphasized the familiar sort of strangeness to succeed in the Soviet marketplace. Drawing on a Georgian cultural repertoire that was recognizable to most Soviets, they offered a more demonstrative and stylized version of the Russian practice of, of blot or exchanging favors. They trafficked in goods whose appeal lay not only in their scarcity, but also in their branding as exotic Georgian products. All the while, they maintained a symbiotic, if sometimes strained, relationship with the Soviet state. Soviet authorities used, promoted, and uh, sometimes resented Georgian success while these traders negotiated between imperial prominence and local self-assertion. As I'll discuss at the end, all this has really important implications for contemporary Russian-Georgian relationship and the evolution of the post-Soviet marketplace. So I, I want to just briefly go into three of the case studies that I'm looking at, um, out, of, out, of, out of many that I'm looking at, to better illustrate how 
how this played out, how Georgians employed both familiarity and strangeness to market their goods, and how these operations evolved in the late Soviet period. For my first case, I'd like to turn to flowers again. Like wine and tea, Georgian flowers were an officially sanctioned commodity that enjoyed state subsidies and access to official distribution channels. These commodities were also supported by an effective branding campaign that was designed by Georgians but sponsored and funded by the Soviet state. Such branding mixed familiarity and strangeness in equal parts. You can see here the uh, second bottle from the right of Georgian wine. It's marked as nationally, nationally distinct by uh, its use of both the Georgian and the Russian languages on its label. While the Georgian was indecipherable to most consumers, its ethnic difference was instantly recognizable and desirable, marking the product as authentic. Similarly, Georgian tea offered an approachable exoticism that was geared toward pan-Soviet consumption. Here we can see containers of tea labeled with, with stylized uh, Cyrillic writing evocative of the Georgian alphabet and images, which I think are hard to see back there, but of, of Georgia's famous Black Sea coastline and, and mountains. All of this evoking a certain image of Georgia in the Soviet imagination. While flowers did not come in official packaging, they were linked in the minds of Soviet consumers to official depictions of the Caucasus, and Georgia in particular, as a subtropical paradise. The idea of a perpetually sunny Georgia was propagated in literature, films, and tourist brochures, and was on display at the Georgian Pavilion at the All-Union Exhibition of the Achievements of the Soviet Economy, or Vedan Kha, in Moscow. Here you can see the Georgian Pavilion flanked by these 18-foot Orientalist um, columns and, and palm trees on either side. And this is, this is in Moscow, where palm trees don't, don't grow so easily. Um, this, is, this is from the mid-50s. The exhibition uh, was launched in the late 1930s. Uh, enclosed within the pavilion was a vast greenhouse with exotic flowers, tea plants, orange trees, and grapevines. The exhibit was peopled with real live Georgians, including uh, Georgians serving wine and, and cigarettes, and Georgian dancers who performed not only folk numbers, but also these newer dances devoted to Soviet economic production, including the botanically inspired dance of, of the flower children, which, which I've never actually seen. I, I'm really kind of dying to, uh, but it's referred to repeatedly in the, in the exhibit's archival record. Georgian trade networks profited from the symbolic value of these products that were recognized, branded, and celebrated in official Soviet culture. But authorities could not always control the way these goods were circulated. Faced with official shortages and the need to import flowers from abroad in exchange for hard currency, by the mid-1960s, authorities began to adopt a more tolerant stance toward Moscow's impromptu flower markets. Yet officials were not quite sure how to handle the fact that these markets were soon dominated by, by Georgian traders. According to a classified 1967 report, after the Moscow city Soviet started allowing cultivators to sell flowers directly in the Soviet capital, Georgians came to dominate the flower market, selling flowers at prices three to four times higher than those set by the state. While in theory these Georgians were supposed to be the people growing the flowers themselves, uh, the report said that they were in fact, quote, people without a specific occupation who transported large batches of flowers on numerous back and forth flights between Tbilisi and Moscow. The report noted particularly the complaint of a Moscow flower company which claimed that the illegal sale of so many flowers meant that their enterprise was uh, hundreds of thousands of flowers short in official shipments it was supposed to receive from Georgia. The documents that I've been looking at suggest that the state periodically intervened when informal trade uh, networks grew too large or too openly flouted Soviet norms. But in this case, the state actually did very little to address the roots of the blooming uh, and booming flower trade based in Georgia. According to uh, statistics, um, generated by the, by the Ministry of Internal Affairs and the KGB, 
By the mid-1960s, close to 25% of Georgia's able-bodied population was actually working outside the official economy. Uh, reports describe collective farms where these flowers uh, were grown, um, saying that, uh, noting the widespread use of unauthorized laborers. So collective farmers would pay other people to farm for them while they would go off and trade their flowers in Russia. Even if the central authorities wanted to address these issues, and, and um, I'm not entirely sure that they thought it would be possible or necessarily worthwhile, they were often stymied by local officials in Georgia. In the case of the Georgian flower traders in Moscow and these complaints that, that were generated, the Georgian Council of Ministers simply suggested the possibility of opening an official store in Moscow to sell these flowers from Georgia directly to consumers. Um, so Georgians selling flowers directly uh, with their own store in Moscow. The next case that I'm going to talk about illustrates not only the development of unauthorized trading in official goods, but also an entirely new consumer goods that were illicitly produced in Soviet Georgia. By the early 1970s, entrepreneurs in Georgia operated a whole network of unofficial workshops where they used state resources to produce uh, cheap consumer goods. And so they were known simply as, as businessmen or sakmosanebi in, in Georgian. They enriched themselves by identifying and producing scarce products, taking resources that were intended to produce uh, one thing and making another that, that would sell better. They capitalized on Georgia's reputation for rare commodities, and they relied on many of the existing Georgian trade networks, even as they expanded them further into Russian markets. Here we can see some of the goods that these entrepreneurs uh, trafficked in, uh, scarves, uh, nylon bags, and um, even in the bottom right, Wrigley's, Wrigley's chewing gum that uh, was probably a knockoff made in Georgia. The most famous of the, of the so-called businessmen uh, was probably Otar Lazishvili. By the late 1960s, Lazishvili earned millions of rubles selling his goods throughout the Soviet Union. In Georgia, he ran these facilities that produced unauthorized goods uh, from diverted state property, while in Russia, he and, and a group of associates distributed their products and uh, gained protection by making deals with high-ranking officials, including in the law enforcement community. Officially, Lazishvili um, was, uh, was a party member. Uh, although he had not finished uh, university, he um, was officially employed as the associate laboratory director of a factory in Tbilisi. And he appeared on paper to be a person of, of middling importance. Uh, in fact, he ran this entire chain of underground workshops and spent probably more of his time in Moscow than in Tbilisi. The scale of this operation was such that it was not easily concealed, but Lazishvili had little to worry about in Tbilisi itself, where he had the support of many high-ranking officials, um, as well as the public. He engaged in neighborhood philanthropy, and he was famous for the gifts that he would give to, uh, to leading cultural figures, to uh, leading political figures, uh, and their family members, including the wife of Georgian uh, First Party Secretary, Vasily Mjavanadze. So Mjavanadze, who you can see here um, on the right, escorting Brezhnev uh, at a sporting event in Tbilisi, led Georgia from the late 1950s to the early 1970s. Lazi Shvili, this entrepreneur's downfall, coincided with the dismissal of Mjavanadze from his post in 1972 and the rise of a young Edward Shevardnadze, who would go on to become the president of independent Georgia, but was then the head of the Ministry of Internal Affairs of, of the Soviet Republic. There was an effort in the KGB and the Ministry of Internal Affairs to uh, rein things in in Georgia, a sense that things had gotten out of hand under Javanadze, and Shevardnadze essentially sought to impress his superiors in, in the Soviet capital. Shevardnadze targeted perhaps the most prosaic item in this line of consumer goods that Lazi Shvili, the Georgian underground entrepreneur, uh, produced easily transportable nylon bags. I think the, bana the, the banality of this item speaks to some of the peculiarities of the Soviet economy. These bags were so widely desired, uh, at least the big reason why they were so widely desired, was because the scarcity of official goods 
required Soviets to always have a bag on hand in case goods suddenly became available. Yet the same command economy that caused shortages was unable to produce this um, somewhat elegant consumer solution identified by this underground entrepreneur. Shevardnadze's investigation broadened and Lazishvili was forced to, to flee to Moscow where uh, it's believed that he hoped to seek out the protection of allies in the prosecutor general's office. The KGB actually ended up arresting him in the outer office of the prosecutor general, um, thereby avoiding a major interagency uh, struggle. But it seems that Lazishvili benefited from his high-ranking connections. He, he had a trial, he was convicted, he was sentenced to capital punishment. This was quickly um, reduced to uh, serving out 15 years in a medical clinic. Uh, Javanadze retired from the Politburo. Um, you know, it's, it's said that he retired in shame, but there's nothing in the official reports or press reports uh, about any reason for him leaving besides old age. And the presence of underground entrepreneurs operating out of Georgia continued to be an issue even if Shevardnadze uh, reined them in or at least forced them to be more restrained and more covert after he became first party secretary of Georgia in the end of 1972. Through these periodic interventions, the Soviet state was able to manage, if not eradicate, unauthorized trading. But by the, late 19, by, the, er, by the late 1970s and early 1980s, the state was forced to contend with the slightly different element, increasingly assertive Georgian organized crime networks. So Georgians were especially prevalent among the Soviet Vorev Zakonya, or thieves in law, who were crime bosses specializing in explicitly illegal activities, so not the production of, of um, consumer goods through um, illicitly gained material, but things like theft, racketeering, and so on. In the context of organized crime, Georgians once again employed both strangeness and familiarity to gain prominence. For example, they were more likely than their Russian counterparts to rely on ethnically exclusive kinship circles, yet also comfortable establishing connections with criminal networks outside of Georgia. They spoke Russian with outsiders, but Georgian among themselves, and they were often called by nicknames that, that played up and evoked their national origins. While the thieves in law had been around for decades, it was a group of Georgians that actually pushed the organization to get more involved in the official economy, which the thieves had typically scorned. As the economy liberalized under Gorbachev, they wrested control of newly formed Soviet cooperatives, and they were well positioned to take advantage of this poorly regulated wave of privatization in the early 1990s, especially in Georgia. I think the success of both formal and informal Georgian economic networks illustrates some of the opportunities as well as the tensions of Soviet empire. On the one hand, the Soviet Union offered a vast market for Georgian traders. Central authorities promoted official Georgian enterprises and state policies gave Georgian producers virtual monopolies on several key goods. On the other hand, Georgian trade networks were subject to prosecution if they grew too big too successful or operated too openly. These trade networks were relied upon by Soviet consumers, yet their success sometimes generated popular resentment, traces of which can be found in a number of Soviet era jokes. In these jokes, Georgians came to stand in for all ethnically distinct traders from the Caucasus, whether they were in reality Georgians, Armenians, or Azeris. At the same time, in Georgia, frustrations grew on the restrictions that the imperial state placed on local economic enterprise, as well as on local cultural expression. In this context, uh, the perception was that theft from the Soviet state was perhaps corrupt, but not necessarily immoral. Certainly not all or even most Georgians were active participants in the informal economy. And many Georgian intellectuals, in fact, were appalled at the, the reputation Georgians had as speculators. At the same time, for Georgians involved in the in informal economy, including the thieves in law, it was possible to appeal to explicitly national Georgian standards of honor, honor and morality, even as they flaunted Soviet legality. These Georgian trade networks 
effectively helped bind this empire of diasporas together, but they also ended up undermining central control. So briefly, how have these networks evolved since the collapse of the Soviet empire, and what is the legacy of the Georgians' Soviet era success? Perhaps most obviously, these networks have lost the monopolies they once, once enjoyed on exotic and rare commodities. The demise of the Soviet Union has completely devastated Georgia's once protected tea industry. And now you can, you can sit at a cafe in western Georgia with a uh, decrepit tea plantation behind you and, and the only tea you'll get is, is uh, Lipton or other tea produced in Sri Lanka. Cheap consumer goods of the kind that Lazishvili once produced, like nylon bags and so on, are now bought from China, where the rest of the world actually buys them too. Uh, some of the specialized goods that Georgians produce, like wine and mineral water, are, are still um, being produced quite widely, but as, as most of you probably know, they were banned by Russia in 2006 amidst worsening relations between Russia and Georgia in a measure that was effectively aimed at depriving these entrepreneurs at, uh, of their ability to bring some of their most famous uh, Georgian-branded goods to Russian markets. Petty trading and commodities like flowers and oranges certainly continues, and remittances sent from Georgian traders in Russia remain a significant part of the Georgian economy. But I think in terms of their significance, economically at least, in Russia itself, much of this Georgian trading today is relatively marginal, since Russian consumers now have alternatives, and Russian immigration policy restricts the movement of Georgian traders across international borders. The continuing prominence of the Georgian thieves in law is often commented on, um, whether it um, is intended to, uh, uh, as a criticism to, to Georgians residing um, in Russia or even um, something that, that is boasted about. Um, but it's more difficult to document this. We can certainly, um, agree that these networks have evolved dramatically since Soviet collapse and that their uh, significance has appeared to wane with the rise of state power in Russia under Putin and in Georgia under Saakashvili. But they're by no means limited to the former Soviet Union and uh, they've turned up in places like Spain and Austria where periodic arrests of so-called Russian organized crime groups turns up a, a long list of Georgian names. I think it remains to be seen whether the thieves-in-law is a somewhat coherent group of criminals professing their own sort of moral code will endure or become something of a quaint relic of the Soviet past in a more globalized uh, criminal marketplace. Also, I think that while they continue to capture the public ima ma imagination, both, both in Russia and in the US, their ability to steer economic development should not be overstated. Um, in Russian markets, for example, systemic and global factors like inflation are all too easily blamed on mysterious so-called mafias. While the economic importance of Georgian trade networks has, has declined relative to the, to the Soviet period, they do retain a, an important uh, place in the Russian imagination and they're often linked in people's minds to broader perceptions of so-called persons of Caucasian nationality. While ethnic distinctiveness could in many ways be an asset in the expressly multi-ethnic Soviet state, it's now linked to economic dislocation and geopolitical suspicion. These formerly internal diasporas from the South Caucasus are now transnational ones that operate across state lines, while some of the others, like Chechens, are Russian citizens but are linked to a potentially separatist region. In this context, the ethnicization of the marketplace has uh, led to sometimes violent backlashes against traders from the Caucasus, and I think the, the geopolitical uh, context has, has hardened public perceptions. These newly transnational diasporas generate tension not only in host societies, but also when they return to their homelands. Georgia, like many other uh, post-Soviet states, has made a great effort to reach out to its diaspora in Russia for investment and intellectual capital. Yet to give one example, when 
Bidzi Ivan Ishvili, who's a Georgian oligarch who made his fortune in Russia, recently sought to establish an opposition party in his native country. He was attacked as a supposed head of a secret pro-Russian center by a member of Georgia's ruling party. These diasporas can serve as strategic bridges between a periphery and center and between homelands and a foreign capital. But as bridges, they are often trapped in the position of belonging to both sides at once while being fully trusted by neither. While the Soviet Union's diaspora of Georgian traders successfully navigated between local assertion and imperial prominence, at least for a time, I think the tension to, uh, between loyalty to a foreign state and loyalty to one's homeland is much more difficult to navigate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, I want to begin by asking this a little bit more about the notions of internal diasporas. You talked about that we didn't have a Russian empire, but an empire of different diasporas. And I'm curious, uh, how did the Russians themselves respond to that? If you could talk about that a little more. You hinted about the Moscow flower merchants who kind of criticized uh, the lack of flowers because of the Georgian control of that, uh, that marketplace. But, but did Russians begin to feel themselves as the exploited majority within the empire, um, which would manifest itself at the very end of the Soviet Union? But was this the beginnings of the, the feeling of kind of being exploited and used in order to keep the empire going? Yeah, I, mean, I think, well, when we talk about the uh, empire of diasporas, you know, it's Im important to remember that Russians were actually, you know, themselves a major diaspora and, you know, spread out with the expansion of the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union um, to Central Asia, uh, the Baltic states, and so on. So they were um, by no means confined to Russia itself and were um, you know, important com component of this, this vast internal movement. But in terms of Russians and Russia, you know, s this becomes a real issue, I think, after World War II, where there is this, this increasing state sanction for, for Russian, of Russian nationalism in Russia an increasing effort to define uh, Russia itself um, not simply as a center of a multi-ethnic uh, internationalist communist movement, but as a, as a more ethnically Russian place. And so, yeah, there is a, there is a, uh, a lot of resentment um, both in Moscow um, and Russian cities where uh, there's a sense that um, subsidies are sent uh, from the center to to places like Georgia, and um, they're essentially used uh, to, to personally enrich uh, Georgians, while Georgians then aren't producing in return the things like tea uh, of the quality or in the manner that, that are, that are you know, expected. So there's a sense that there's an unequal exchange. Um, there's a sense that um, in their own country, in their own capital, in their own city, Russians um, are slipping in terms of living standards, which I think is borne out by some of the, the statistics um, that one finds in terms of comparative living standards, um, probably relatively higher in, in the Baltics and in, in, in Georgia. Of course, Georgia didn't, didn't have a large um, Russian population, or at least not as large as, as that in the, in the Baltic states, but um, you see also resentment in, in Georgia itself, where, where Russians um, uh, stationed there or living there uh, often complain that they're being treated like second-class citizens in their own country and that they're passed over for positions um, in favor of Georgians. And, you know, this is not something that um, is expressed, you know, continuously, but you see it, you know, at, at certain key events um, like the 1956 uh, demonstrations in Tbilisi. Um, you see, you know, this, there's a huge wave of letters, you know, written to Moscow complaining of this and, um, letters written, you know, in, in, in Russian cities complaining about, about the kind of second-class uh, nature of, of, of Russia's place in the empire. And there's a sense, too, in this, you know, that, that um, among some of the letter writers, at least, that um, Russians should not only be, you know, equal citizens, but that they have a, a privileged uh, place in the empire. And this is one of the tensions that, that I think um, manifests itself in the, the end of the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. My name is Thomas Blinde. 
I once worked for an engineering company in London that did business with the Soviet Union in the 60s. They occasionally bought some Georgian wines as a trade sweetener, including the well-known brand Sinindali. How did this trade network with London work at that time? Was it very significant? Well, uh, thank you for your question and for the for the uh, interesting uh, anecdote. Um, Georgian wines and Georgian products were were sold not only within the Soviet Union but also beyond the Soviet Union, and there was a particular effort uh, made to to sell them um, to the to Soviet bloc countries, to countries allied with the Soviet Union. Um, I um, don't know about about direct trade with London or through which channels that might have might have occurred. Um, but you know that is, a, I think, an important dimension of this is is that these, um, while there is a great deal of internal movement and internal trade networks within the Soviet Union, that these were often linked to to broader international um, networks. Uh, and you know, speaking of tea, for example, um, the Soviets traded with India, with China, uh, bringing tea into the Soviet Union. In times when when the not enough official Georgian tea was produced, they would blend it with with Georgian tea, and so that these these internal networks were sometimes plugged into to larger external ones. So I imagine the wine um, ended up in in London through probably Eastern Europe, but I don't know about the the network in particular. Thank you. Hi, thanks for a very enlightening presentation. I recently came back from six months in Georgia, and I have to tell you, I was never served Georgian tea in any restaurant I went to, so this is a revelation. I wanted to ask you about the strange Georgian economy as it is now. As you know very well, one of the great uh, products there for its uh, gross domestic product is used cars, importation from other places and their great car markets and so on. And then the problem of any kind of uh, import, which is sky high, the markups on, on consumer products are astonishing. And I gather it's controlled by small circles in power. Say something about the, the internal workings of the Georgian economy and the role of the thieves in law in Georgia. Uh, of course, we know the police at the low levels are not corrupt and Shakashvili's uh, cataclysmic uh, changes there. But at the higher levels, there seem to be things that are not uh, totally transparent and uh, open. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you know, I've, I've been going to Georgia for um, eleven years now, and so I think there's you know, there's been a a great change in, ter in terms of the thieves and laws role, you know, in Georgia. While you know, when I um, first started going to Georgia in two thousand one, you know, they was they operated more or less openly, or at least were openly spoken of quite extensively, to the extent that when my, when my apartment was actually broken into, my friend suggested that I go to, to, to talk to someone who would talk to someone in the thieves-in-law to find out who did this. Um, you know, they've, they've generally, my sense is they've generally left Georgia. I mean, there's nothing really holding them there in particular. Um, in terms of the, the contemporary Georgian economy, I mean, there's been a great reduction of, of everyday corruption. So, um, you know, what I saw when I first started going to Georgia, you know, based on my discussions with people there and my own research, uh, essentially I, I see this as, as a continuation of the, of the practices of the Brezhnev era. Uh, and probably in an exaggerated form where, you know, you saw bribes being paid openly to, to um, traffic police, um, you know, flouting of wealth that was clearly illicitly gained, you know, ministers with with salaries that were, you know, a hundred dollars a month, you know, building these enormous houses. You know, that's been that's been reined in. Um, in terms of what's happening now, I mean it's not really entirely clear to me. I, I think, you know, in many ways it's it's part of a more globalized pattern of corruption where you see, you know, this uh, poor supervision of, of uh, state procurement. Um, 
a lot of you know unclear financing of of uh, government uh, buildings, uh, unclear what's happening in the construction sector uh, in general. Besides, you know, there's a huge boom, and I'm not sure who's who's benefiting for that or who's you know making sure all the permits are are acquired for these really you know, enormous things they're building. Um, so I don't know if I see, you know, a, a thieves in law role there. I think I, I, you know, there's probably points to more, you know, influence within within elite circles and the ruling party. Thank you very much for an interesting presentation. My name is Olga Litvin. Um, I've seen in Ukraine a different phenomenon. They also have this um, change that they no longer use Ukrainian products as they did before, but they now import many teas, goods, etc. But what you see on a very local level in the agriculture is people still growing their own berries, their own fruit, whatever it is. Is there such a thing in Georgia, for example, with the tea or with various things that are now mostly imported on a larger scale? Thank you. Yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, um, the kind of Informal trade and and you know everyday, especially agricultural goods, is is, is a huge part of uh, makes up probably a huge part of the Georgian economy. And you know you regularly see you know whatever is kind of in in season. Um, you know you see these these ladas loaded you know all the way really up to to the top of the you know the the roof you know filled with say like hazelnuts or filled with grapes uh, or filled with with oranges. Um, and these are traded, um, you know, throughout Georgia and Georgian cities, you know, in markets, um, and not just big markets, but you know, street corners. And the, there's been an effort to try to regulate this in Tbilisi, but it, you know, really it continues to go on. Um, so that's, you know, um, I suppose a continuation of of, of petty trading, um, and you know. Other Georgian goods like like wine and mineral water, I, mean, I think there's been a relatively successful effort to to market them not only in Georgia and they're still very popular in Georgia, uh, but you know in in, in Europe, um, Israel, uh, with its large um, former Soviet diaspora, um, the United States to some extent. Um, in terms of consumer goods, I mean there's really not much much of that still produced in in Georgia. Um, most of that you know comes from China as it as it does. Uh, for us here. A quick question, Eric, a, a rather technical question um, about the, the the markings that were put on various Georgian products. Um, was that required under Soviet law? Were you supposed to actually designate where goods came from, where they were produced, or was that something that simply Georgians decided or other regions decided to do individually just to kind of sh add greatest, greater marketability to products? I mean, the, the, the kind of celebration of the, the ethnic origins and ethnic associations of products was something that was, that was stressed uniformly in the Soviet Union um, as, as a way to, to demonstrate to Soviet citizens that they had an entirely self-sufficient um, economy and culture and um, as, you know, in celebration of the ethnic, the ethnic diversity of this, of this multi-ethnic state. Um, of course, different, you know, different um, nationalities had not only different goods, but different different uh, mythologies, a different uh, set of associations in the in the Soviet context. And I think that the in the Georgian case, these these associations, this cultural repertoire was was really well developed. It goes, I think, back to the imperial period. And in contrast to other goods and products, Georgians themselves played a, a major role in in designing um, and and conceptualizing and promoting. Uh, this this brand. So you know, there there were Georgian artists involved, um, Georgian um, writers, Georgian um, uh, business people who are really you know you, you know saw this opportunity and, and you know made uh, made a great deal out of it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Down the front, right here. Hi, Ian Mil Mishula from the Voice of America Georgian Service. Uh, based on your presentation, it seems like the transition from the command econo economy or from the 60s throughout the 90s and the independence of Georgia, uh, the Georgian entrepreneurial spirit basically died. 
uh, one day Georgians were all over the Russian marketplace and the next day, relatively speaking, of course, they disappeared from it um, due to some political or other reasons. Uh, based on your observations, is that spirit still somewhere in the Georgian entrepreneurial societies? Is it, have you noticed that there is a potential, but due to the restrictions, whether it's from the government or the political uh, climate, it's not really flourishing, or is it gone? Um, yeah, in terms of the, the, you know, the Georgian entrepreneurial uh, spirit, um, I mean, the point I was making was not that there was a major shift um, in mentality. I mean, I think there was, um, in terms of Georgia's relationship with, with Russia and relationship with Moscow, um, but that the, the niches and the, the opportunities that this participation, this multi-ethnic empire created were simply, you know, simply vanished. Um, and so these networks uh, went from being playing this rather critical role in a relatively closed multi-ethnic society to being um, a lesser important network in a in a um, in a post-Soviet context and 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 um, you know subject perhaps perhaps marginalized too to the globalization of the economy as well. Um, I mean, I think this this. Um, Entrepreneurial spirit, um, if it can be described as such, I mean this 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 desire to to seek out um, niches to market goods to market Georgian products is very much um, alive. Um, I don't think it you know has you know the what the market is. I think it still remains to be defined, and um, what Georgian distinctiveness means in a in a more global context is it remains to be defined. Um, but, you know, there is, um, I mean, every, everything from the kind of everyday traders, you know, who, who today still are, you know, bringing hazelnuts from Western Georgia to sell in Tbilisi to um, efforts really to, to redesign and, um, you know, frankly improve the quality of, of Georgian wine, um, at least the kind that's sold um, since, um, you know, there was this, I think, by the end of the Soviet period, a decline in the quality of official wine and the, you know, the kind of stuff that was sold informally or produced, you know, in, in homes, you know, and given was, 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 was high quality. I think that, you know, that continues. And so, um, you know, I'm generally optimistic uh, about some of these products. Um, I think, for example, the, the Russian ban on, on Borjomi and Georgian wine has not had a major impact. And, I, you know, I, I agree with Georgians who say that, you know, it's actually – uh, been you know a, a stimulus to try to try to um, really improve the quality of these goods and market them to to the EU and other places. Uh, Claire Kaiser, University of Pennsylvania. Um, I actually had a question about I guess the uh, regions in uh, in which a lot of these more traditional Georgian products, I suppose, were being produced. Um, in particular, Achara and um, Abkhazia. Um, and I'm curious as to, I guess, what sort of benefits um, these autonomous regions, I guess, gained from products being built as Georgian um, throughout the Union, but you know, maybe the relationship between the Abkhaz and Georgian populations, uh, you know, in the 60s in particular, uh, were not necessarily as um, as friendly as perhaps uh, maybe uh, build. I don't know um, if that makes sense, but mm -hmm. be interested to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you. Thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, it is. It's, it's. I think it's really, you know, worth pointing out that you know a lot of the subtropical goods, as they were, they were branded and and celebrated. Um, you know, were produced in, in Ajara and 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 Abkhazia, and um, in terms of what this meant for these regions, plays in their relationship to Tbilisi. Um, I mean, I think, I think it's it's somewhat complicated. Um, there. Um, the in, in terms of the what what the informal economy meant for these regions, I mean, on the one hand, there was uh, a broad-based uh, cooperation um, in um, among, say, different ethnic groups, Abkhaz and Georgians, in in, in, in Abkhazia, um, in selling and, and and marketing these goods. 
on the other hand, you know, the, the fact that they were often controlled by, by informal networks um, could also be exclusionary. And so people um, weren't quite sure how to access some of the benefits of these goods. And, um, you know, there was, in the case of Abkhazia, um, their cultivation of these goods meant um, that, um, and tea in particular, meant that um, uh, many migrants had to be um, sent to Abkhazia to cultivate the tea. And so this, in this case, you know, somewhat, there were Georgians in Abkhazia before this, but, you know, this, this somewhat changed the, uh, the balance. Um, and certainly, I think, at the time of, of independence, you know, there was a sense that, you know, in, in Ajara and in, in Abkhazia that um, the benefits, the wealth of, of these industries could essentially be, be nationalized within those republics. And so I think that, you know, gave a certain self-confidence to, to uh, separatist leaders in those regions. In the back. Uh, thank you, and I'm Terry Campo. Uh, I re ran USAID's energy programs in Georgia at the tr early part of the transition period. And my tr experience at that time was everything was corrupt through and through at uh, every level, but that, the, that there was an ethnic overlay, but I wonder how much of it was a geographic overlay for all the products that you would want to acquire within the country, all the products and services you were working within one network or the other, but they would, they, they would typically be not only uh, Mingrelians versus Ossetians versus Abkhaz, but they would be, they'd be the geographic overlay. I'm trying to figure out to what extent do you think it was geography networks, or geographical networks uh, versus ethnic and clan networks? In terms of the, tr the trade in these goods, um, I mean, I think, I think in many cases it was both of them um, overlapping. Um, you know, a lot of I, I've looked at. Um, there's a very interesting case actually of um, a Georgian student who who turns up um, murdered in the 1960s in, in Volgograd, and. Um, you know, it's very difficult to research a second economy in general because, you know, it only appears when, when the state, you know, grows concerned with it. Only then is a record generated. Otherwise, it seems to be kind of, you know, going on every day and it's hard to get at. So this Georgian turns up murdered. Um, it turns out, you know, there's a whole complicated story behind it, but it leads back to these, these groups of currency speculators in Moscow. In that case, you know, it seemed to be uh, the overlapping both of, of – um, Western Georgian geographic um, connection, a Mingrelian connection within that, and then family networks, so extended family networks within it. So I think, you know, if we think of, you know, what made these networks successful in terms of their, their exclusivity and their, um, you know, ability to trust one another and enforce contracts in the absence of this legal regulation, you know, I think the, um, the kind of more it's, it's overlaid, and the more that you know, group mem members can trust each other, I, I think you know there's often the you know reinforcement of, of these of these geographic, um, ethnic, and 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 kinship to um, ties. Take one more question up front. As you know, the population of Tbilisi is, uh, is an important component of the entire country's population, but overall, the population is declining, mm -hmm. and the government is a little cagey on giving the statistics. How do you see the future in terms of population increase? As you know also, many people are leaving Georgia. They're trying to get jobs in, in Europe, trying to get to the States. There's a proliferation of universities, but the quality is, is indifferent in many cases, and there's real concern about economic opportunities. The poverty level is quite high. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I it's all I've seen is are the official statistics, which suggest which which suggests that the the population has has at least stabilized. They're not you know suffering this huge um, out migration as they did in the in the in the 1990s. Um, but you know, I mean, I think the, um, the the larger question is, you know, what um, what it means to migrate in you know in the contemporary um, global economy, and whether these you know people you know who leave will be able to come back easily, and will be able to integrate. Um, you know, I I I do get the sense that um, 
that um, you know, I mean, that, you know, if you look at birth rates, for example, they seem to be going up. Um, so you know, there is you know, there are people you know invested in in staying to Georgia. There has been this effort to um, repatriate or re uh, have return um, George, you know, Russian Georgians who are in Russia, you know, coming back to to Georgia. Whether they'll stay, I mean, I suppose it's up to them, and I suppose people have have a lot of options if you know with with you know highly skilled labor um, in the international marketplace. So, um, you know, I, I'd say I'm guardedly optimistic in that sense. Thank you. Well, I think it's good to end on, always good to end on op optimistic notes. So I'd like to thank Eric very much for his presentation. Thank you very much for your questions, and we look forward to seeing you at future Kennan Institute events. Thanks so much. Thank you.